committee. Since we don't have a chair's meeting and we have five whole minutes um, and I am starting to feel very pressured by trying to get all the bills we're gonna need to get out of here. There is a end of session planning tomorrow. Um, I'm having trouble organizing this week. Joint fiscal starts at eight o'clock tomorrow morning. So I uh, thought we might, we had some discussion. I sent you home with homework. Uh, Senator Bray did his homework. Well, and I'm, I'm wondering if there, one way to, to deal with it is to screen share it. I know that Faith emailed it out. But it's uh, I think Senator compact. Pearson, you are now host. So if you make Senator Bray co-host. What's this message? It says installing virus on your computer now. What's that? I have no oh, idea. Andrew Pearson yeah. is in charge. He is now Hal. Oh. <laughs> All right, Senator Bray, I think you can now co or uh, post your whatever share. Do you know how to do that? Yeah, I think this is going to work. The weird thing Something is... Something is I, coming up. Okay, looks good. I, I can't see what precisely what you see. So, I see some principles for 2021 broadband program. Is it Big enough, big, bigger, smaller. Uh, that I, I, I can read it. It's got some stuff around the edges, but if I can read it, I think most people can. So, uh, I, I, you know, you were thinking about, I mean, there's so much stuff going on. For me, I was just trying to boil it down to have some yeah. principles to make decisions by. And I think we actually talked, they turns out a lot of them came up today in the conversation already, but um, you know, utilities have a, a very conservative approach because they reliability is the one of the most important things they ever uh, that they're re, they're responsible for and they get rated on on reliability, safety and reliability are first and foremost. And so it made me think about well how although we've talked about CUDs as sort of this more homegrown grassroots thing, I was really trying to put a, a engineering utility m mindset to the whole thing. So building for durability, like that 30 to 40 year investment. Uh, and I don't know if that only means fiber or there's, uh, you know, someone might say, oh, well, don't just think fiber. You should think of uh, cable as well. I don't know the answer to that one. But whatever it is, something that uh, is long-lived. And, and then the B, um, a, adopt an appropriate industry standard and require its use by any entity funded by the program so that we end up with, um, you know, Christine Halquist said it a couple months ago, there, there was when the RE, when the Rural Electrification Act came through, they published a, a standard and he, uh, she said that there is even today sort of a handbook that spells out all the standards. And if you're building stuff, you build exactly to that standard from the wires to your house to the substation. And um, so it provides for stability uh, across the system as opposed to getting islands of different um, solutions delivered, can't. which it's I don't think... Yeah. Can I interrupt here? I was thinking today as Irv was talking and we were talking about overbuilding and then the discussion we had with Consolidated yeah. that you can't just hook fiber up the cable. So if there's cable downtown and the uh, somebody wants to go from this isolated road to that isolated road in the fastest way is through downtown, they have to double string uh -huh. unless there, you know, it's, there's also a, a whole set of backup. Right. Um, so that you want it so that no matter who owns it, at some point you just splice or plug it together and you can have a united system, which is this, 
the engineering standards. Right. And I don't know if, I mean, uh, so Ir Irv didn't know if we have such a thing that's guiding the development of all the CUDs now, but it'd be interesting to know. And I'm just borrowing that from Christine's visit two months yeah. ago. Um, D is really, I think, in part what you're talking about, you know, requiring interoperability so that no funded entity becomes an island so that you, because uh, these things, who knows what the, uh, what will happen to them over time, we wouldn't want things that didn't work well with each other and part of the way to make them work well with each other is have a common standard. C is um, require the ability to evolve and upgrade the design at the design and engineering level so that uh, our investment lasts and keeps on evolving with our own needs. Um, then second is the other thing we've talked about more and more lately, which seems like a good role. So the state becomes a technical assistance center for design engineering, permitting, legal, uh, marketing got thrown in today. I was thinking about it as a turnkey solution. So we, um, by standardizing, we can lower the cost for everyone by basically creating a little bit of, a, I don't want to imply something too simple when I say cookie cutter, but something where we get to use this same expertise and information over and over again with as little customizing as possible. Then the state becomes, uh, maybe it's handling federal money as well. I don't know. Our other role becomes funding. Um, a fourth thing here, state provides a mechanism for managing the entities and the questions relating to rights and responsibilities that they have, as well as the relationships between them. Um, is there could be quote unquote border conflicts, uh, things like that. And then fifth, thinking really longer term, like five and 10 and 20 years out, uh, state ensures that entities have provisions for mergers, acquisitions, and closures, including to the degree possible recoverability on the part of the state of Vermont of its investment if it's not already fully depreciated. So uh, could be two CUDs say, you know, this is great, but we could save a lot of back office expense by just becoming one bigger CUD and we'll do all the billing. So then maybe they merge. And I don't know how you structure them from the get-go to make that easier, but um, I don't know that in 20 years from now, we want to have 14 CUDs. Maybe maybe by then it's two or three, who knows? I, but it would it might save us money and help save cost over the long haul if they were designed with that thought in mind from the beginning, that's all. So that was, that's my, uh, that's what I just wanted to chip into the conversation. Okay. That's a lot of thought. I told you the adrenaline would drop, Senator. <laughs> yeah, I am super tired. I'm sorry. <laughs> Senator Hardy, I think, outlined the entire budget for health and welfare this morning. She has done a tremendous, and all the bills and all the asks that have come to the committee. It was a tremendous job of work, which she did on her own. Um, <laughs> and yeah my eyes started to cross by the end. So it was, uh, it was a lot of work. So, and I have a feeling most of us have kind of hit that tilt point. Has anybody else got anything you want to kind of throw out on the table at this point? But, uh, Senator not Pearson. on the table, but a question, Maria, forgive me if you've already given us this, but do we have a section by section for this guy for the bill? Is it already, is it on our website? Do we know? Yeah, you it's the, you the, do for H360, you do. Okay. And you also have, and it is on your website and you also have a comparison summary of H360 oh, and okay. Senator Brock's bill, S118. I, I appreciate that. The reason I ask is a lot of what we've been talking about is actually in the bill. And, and I think I, now that the concepts are gelling a little bit in my mind, I, I'll just say for myself that I'm going to look at that and see what I think might be missing. Okay. And it might Maria be helpful if we did something with, we do it with miscellaneous tax 
as proposed House Senate. We might do that third block and then we can go through and we can say, okay, section one or you know issue what this is this is the version we're going to choose or we're going to choose to do something else this one we're not you know we're not there yet but go through and decide what we've decided and then just keep working our way down to what we have to do and then somewhere in there and Senator Hardy maybe when you wake up uh we get because we did all the other bills and there are other proposals that have come to us. We had a couple today um, from the affordable housing people that could get pretty broad. Um, and if we want to do that, um, especially in the area of telemedicine, um, that could be a really helpful model. Um, and then we and if you're there, there's also somebody that can assist you at getting on and unmuting <laughs> and being seen. Um, so we've got that. We've had a couple more suggestions. I know Irv. I, it's going to take me a while to sit down and read through Irv's ideas, but I think if we could get at least the two bills and then a, a block and then maybe a list of other things. An inventory um, is. Yeah. Yep, I can, then, I can work on that. Um, and I also, and I think you're, sounds like you're too tired to go through it now. Um, I did start to put together a very high level overview of decision points very ah. high level and it's i i didn't sent it to faith i don't know if she's posted it um you know but i think i i could even pull it up now just to like show you what it is and it that might be something as you're individually thinking about where you want to focus and what needs to be fleshed out that could be helpful and and i think um, we've got time Thursday afternoon and we have all day Friday, which I've been reserving for this. So okay. I think Friday, um, you can put this up and we will look at it. Um, okay. I mean, you can put it up now and just give us the 10,000 foot walk through and then we can spend the whole day on Friday delving in. Senator Brock. Well, one of the things uh, that, that I've done is I've just asked some questions of the uh, department and a couple of other sources, because I, I want to also try to just put in perspective what we're talking about. We're concentrating on CUDs and we're concentrating on unserved addresses. But how much is that part of the overall landscape that we're dealing with uh, as far as the future? And so I've asked uh, just several questions. Are there any statistics? on how many locations currently have internet access available by source. In other words, by name and by type of provider. What's the total universe we're talking about? Second, are there any statistics that would show that of those locations where access is available and how many of such locations have the occupants actually subscribed or connected? And here I'm trying to determine the number of locations listed as served, the number of homes that have actually collected to versus those that have not because that will show you the number of unserved locations that really aren't counted in this total that we've been talking about. Thirdly, are there statistics as to how many additional unserved locations would be served if we made broadband available universally? And then lastly, of the latter, how many of such locations are in areas not currently served by a CUD? Other question. In other words, I, we, we're, we're talking, I'm not sure if we're talking when we're concentrating on the CUDs, are we talking about 80% of the internet? Are we talking about 20% of the internet? And I'm not really sure. And that I think will all, should also drive uh, perhaps some of how we look at the approach. 
I also think, and I'll try to play with this a little bit more, is, is backing up because we have this tendency to jump in with our boots on into the swamp and go attack each and every alligator in it. When in a way that notion of backing up to the 50,000 foot level and look at what the swamp looks like and how do you deal with alligator control overall, which means things like strategy and planning and the 10 year plan, yeah. which I know is not dealt with at all in 360, it's left the department. And that whole issue of planning of all the stuff that we're talking about here, it's the plan and the strategy that to me is the most important driver of what we do. And so our approach in handling it seems to be that we've got to take that into account. I'm just concerned that we're fixing the problem by tightening a lot of screws here and there, but we're not looking at the overall problem. Yeah, and I think we, the thing that struck me the other day when Consolidated was in is the city of Montpelier and probably most of the other built up areas are running on 25-3 if they're lucky. We had that map. I remember all the red lines, those were the cable lines and some of the CUDs are using those, but those cable lines aren't, so it's not, you know, they're, they, we are served by federal standards at 25-3, but if we're going to do 100-100 for everybody, we have those large flat areas that are not outside of EC Fiber and maybe Burlington Telecom, um, they are not getting 100-100. So uh, that's another just thing we need to keep in the back of our minds. Senator Pearson. Can I just add one thing before I, I, I finish up of what we're talking about? The other thing that we have a, a big divide on is that issue of, uh, and I was gonna ask Irv this if we had had, had had time today, and that is what do you tell the person who has no internet access and won't get it for four to five years or perhaps longer to get to that 100-100 standard that we're insisting on? What do you tell that person who has nothing now and who's taking uh, her child to the parking lot of the school at night in the wintertime in order to connect? I think what Irv told us today is that we think, we hope, crisis period seems to be going to be behind us if we're going to have everybody vaccinated. That's assuming that we don't have another pandemic for 100 years. But um, if things go as plans say they're going to go, some of that urgency hopefully will be gone by the next school year. But the potential is there. And with the world as open as it is, um, the potential is much more there than it used to be when it, you know, you had to sail on a ship and it took a week to get here. And then we knew if we had to isolate you when you showed up. So I had, did I have, I had Senator Pearson McDonald and then Senator Pearson. I think I, I did see Senator McDonald first. Um, Madam Chair, um, there, could um, Maria or someone double check on the most, one of the most recent uh, PUC orders of the last uh, maybe two or three weeks ago having to do with uh, Green Mountain Power's role in having a uh, fiber strung along its poles. And um, I think there was something recent and it, it, it would play into our, de our decision making. Yep. That was my request. Sure, I'd be happy to yep. look into that. And um, secondly, um, I no, no, those of you that are not in uh, the Times Argus area there, um, the witness who we don't mention by name, had a long, edit, long editorial, and um, what Senator was, Brock sent it to all of us. Uh, well, thank you, Senator Brock, because <laughs> Senator Brock and I spoke about it uh, over the weekend. Um, it's I've actually seen it before that it was sent to me. Yeah, um, 
it looked forward instead of backwards, which is where we need to be. We look backwards for lessons, not for for uh, correcting uh, hurt feelings, and we look forward to what will work in our in our in our strategy. So, thank you. Okay, Andrew Pearson. I I I hope we can focus on. Um, some of the big goals we, we we have since I've been on this committee, which is seems like a lifetime, but this is my third year. We have uh, wrestled with this 25 three versus 100 hundred. And what do you say to the poor joker that is still on DSL and and is is 200 yards from the cable line? And we're saying, no, we'll only pay for your perfection. Um, I think, Madam Chair, you're right that we're we're if we're moving out of the pandemic and let us hope, then it is a different question. And what the structure so far has been, and I think it's the right one, is not how do we get everybody broadband, uh, although that's a question and we should be moving in that direction, but how do we take care of the unserved and the underserved? And so we haven't we haven't, I've never heard us talk about how do we upgrade the 25-3 people? Um, that doesn't interest me right now. We've got a lot of money, but we don't have, you know, unlimited get everybody fiber money. So uh, to me, it then things flow from there. Then, then things flow from there like we don't actually have to decide should we be buying cable or buying fiber. We can just go to fiber because we're basically going to go where people haven't been willing to build. And in those cases, you might as well make the marginal investment to, to make it future proof. Um, so, I, I, and, I, and I think I found it, one of the things that's come up today, Irv brought it up. I've heard other people bring it up as the way that we wrestle with this independent telecoms how do we help the franklin telephones and, and irv said it well as long as they're willing to commit to serving every address in the territory and i i do think we need to figure out how to define territory but that immediately then if that if consolidated wants to be that i'd even be open to that but they don't want to do that they've made that very plain that they they've had decades to do that they won't do it comcast won't do it so if that and and that hits at our need to deal with the parallel to rural electrification rural electrification wasn't for most people it was for everyone and that's that's to me the posture and and once you once you hit that once you accept that we're starting with unserved and underserved, then you've answered some of the very basics. And, and I think we can quickly move beyond that and, and, and try to get into the more controversial nuts and bolts stuff. But I also want to say, in terms of engineering standards and things like that, I hope that won't be in the bill. I hope that will be baked into some of the expertise that we're trying to set up as resources um, uh, because we typically don't do a great job when we're we're as lay people trying to to craft that um, but anyway I, I don't I'm not that worried about how do you deal with the Montpeliers that are I've only no, got I'm not I'm not worried about that because consolidated is string in line through my backyard as we speak they're going to take care of that I yeah. think where I've heard something different is there's probably a couple roads down Route 12 that could use or somewhere else in a for-profit provider's area that, yeah, they are not going to do it on their own dime because they're for-profit but they'll do it on our dime. And pretty much that's what we've been doing with the connectivity. And there was a uh, fair point, you know, requirement before the PUC that they string so many lines um, in lieu of fines, I think it was. I can see that somewhere in this state, 
there are those last nine miles. If Franklin Telephone was a, well, they are pro hopefully a for-profit. That last, that last nine miles, if we gave them some money, they'd run it because she's got nine hard miles and two customers who may or may not sign up. That I think is where the hard never, you know, over my dead body comes in. You, I can see where there are places and one of the CUDs was working with one of the four profits um, down south of me. Um, and it, I'm not remembering which one, but um, I think. You, you write, Madam Chair. You, you, it's a Franklin telephone company. If we're going to provide money for them to hook up to the end of their territory, we do not wish, to, and, and they, Franklin wants to hook up to uh, a consolidated fiber hookup. We don't want to have the consolidated people who were unwilling to go up that road and unwilling to spend their own money to earn a profit on that Franklin connection. They should be have an open access where you can go in and use their fiber and allow the, and the Franklin folks who invested in it to make the money on it. And that's that's maybe tricky and be no, someone I, smarter I mean, than got, me to got, figure you, that now out. Now you got two telephone, telephone, yeah. Yeah. landline telephones are a regulated utility. They have districts and they have requirements within their districts. So I don't think you're going to see consolidated running through Franklin, nope. but there are places where you've got PUCs and the best way to get up that other nine miles is to pay the guy that's at the bottom of the hill to run it up the hill rather than, and I think that we leave to the PUCs. I, I mean, we're not, we, we, to... we just cannot imagine all that's the jerry-rigging that is going to happen before this is over. That, that's what we have to work out. But but I, I, was, I only mentioned that not to solve that problem, right. but to say that that's the type of solution we have to deal with. And I didn't think you wanted this afternoon to have, you know, no, go into how I to solve. So, we need yeah, to make so sure done. that we get some interconnectivity. And that'll probably be part of a rules process. And we have we to make sure that the, we get it to everybody and we're going to have to figure out a way in getting it to everybody that we also make it possible for them to afford to sign up. And that one's going to be hard or we're going to say, well, we're going to run it by your house and we'll deal with that later. There's a couple proposals out there, but um Maybe that's one where we might want to endow a fund, capitalize a fund with some of the ARPA money, if that's permissible, um, and draw down that or the interest on that to have an ongoing source for subsidies. I have no idea, but um, we've got an awful lot of cash and the push to spend that lot of cash in three years could lead to some poorer decisions. So uh, we're gonna work our way through this. Okay, Senator Bray. Um, so I think part of what um, that the, the uh, stuff I wrote up, that first section that's pretty engineering oriented was in part to end up with a durable solution for the long haul that was reliable, but also to steer clear of these sort of choosing who gets money and who doesn't get money uh, you know it's like leaving the personalities out of it if you're willing to meet the standard then you become eligible and um whoever you are and um yeah and so the one thing that i heard today that i thought was a pretty great idea that's not an engineering standard but it's that commitment to serve every customer as another 
test. And then I think a third test we've talked about was open access. So we don't build a public highway that only one company can drive on. You know? yeah. and, um, and although those things, um, so I agree with Senator Pearson not to write that into, not to write details into the no. statute, but we could write the high level description about interoperability and upgradability and interconnectability and all, all those kinds of things, serving every customer. And then the rule making could get there. We'd put the guardrails on it. Um, anyway, so. Yeah, and the other, the, you know, Irv was um, talking about open access. The one thing he was very clear on is that if we required CUDs to offer $25 a month um, service that you're in the you're in the bond market and you've got to you know you've got to show that you've got the profit to pay the bond it's got to be dedicated and to do that especially in higher low in, yeah higher low income areas people places with more people with lower incomes um, they can't do that, which is one thing to be said for the for-profits because they can do that because they make a higher profit. Um, and, and they have been doing that. So- uh, They also cherry pick where they go. And yes, they do, and that they do. I mean, I mean, that's, but when you are, you know, offering a public service, and it, it gets harder to do those extras, at least in the beginning. If you can grow enough and get enough customer base and make enough profit, then you can do it. But that takes time. Okay, anything else? Maria, thank you for putting that together. I think we'll do better when we're more awake. No problem. That's fine. It uh, is. I think it will be posted. And the I guess the only other thing I'll say is it's definitely a, a work in progress. And if you look at it, and there are particular uh, areas. It's required there, so see your opportunity. And McDonald, you need to mute. You, you want to add or other things. You can uh, mute him. <laughs> uh, just let me know, and I'll revise it. So OK. okay. Oh, I think I want to be host. I can mute people. I admitted Maria. Okay. Um, yeah, we. I think it works really well when we can have a full day. Um, I think we'll have Renewable Energy Vermont in on Thursday if they can come to talk about the battery storage and... Um, then then we'll you know work our way through that bill and if no one objects we'll stick on our little tax section and that's one i think we can sounds like everybody agrees on what we should do with that last piece so that's one i think we can get out and get moving um the revenue bill might be a little more difficult um and Right now, miscellaneous tax is a piece of cake, but um, it might not be before we finish. <laughs> okay, Senator Hardy. Yeah, um, speaking of miscellaneous tax, I sent you an email heads up this morning about some potential amendments I have, which I'll send you when I have them drafted. Okay, I haven't. Yeah, that's okay. I got through my emails last night and there were 200 more this morning. I so. know, it's crazy. They never stop. But I also wanted to ask you, I mean, because this came up in, in health and welfare this morning, what you're hearing in terms of the timing on things. Do you know? Uh, there is a planning meeting for the end of the session at noon tomorrow, but everything I've heard is that we are going home, I believe the 15th of May is our last budgeted day. Um, somewhere in that second week of May, um, the goal is to get the budget out next Tuesday, but then the budget 
usually goes through a week or more of negotiations, um, not just with the House and the Senate, but sometimes efforts to keep it from being vetoed. Um, and then other committees are throwing other things in to be added on. So that usually, I, there's a set number, but I think it's, um, it's, it's usually about two weeks after it comes out. The budget is the last bill to go. It is usually preceded by the miscellaneous tax bill because depending, less now than used to be, but um, I can remember being told, you know, we need a quarter of a million dollars, raise it. Um, so, that those are the, usually the last two bills to go out the door. Right, okay. Um, I just wanted to know, because the, the budget, it surprised me this morning when I heard that they were trying to get the budget out by next Tuesday. But well, they've been trying to get 315 out since February 1st. Fair point. If, if not true. January 6th. <laughs> so um, things, you know, Getting them out doesn't mean it's the end. Um, we didn't do it last year, and I don't think we did it the year before, but normally they will cut, they will suspend morning committees a week to two weeks before the end so that this committee and approps can work all day. Um, you know, all these bills for voting out of health and welfare will end up in a probes, if not here, um, we usually get a lot of energy and economic development bills at the end. Um, and there's been less of a volume this year than other years, but uh, it's still going to take us some time to get broadband put together and then negotiated with the House. So we need to have time to do that. Senator Pearson. Well, do you, is it your understanding that when the budget, when a probes tries to vote the budget in a week, that it would include ARPA money? ARPA, I, I mean, I'm surprised, for instance, in my morning committee, we haven't been asked to suggest ideas. What about as economic development or healthcare? Have you? There is some ARPA money in the budget as it came from the house right. joint fiscal committee is meeting tomorrow morning because arpa is a grant and joint fiscal has to agree to accept the grant right and last year what we did is we accepted the grant with these conditions. Um, a certain bucket was just emergency funds, the administration could use them. Then there was another bucket they could use with joint fiscal approval, but the bulk of the money was went through the appropriations process. This year, I think we're still trying, you know, this planning meeting is putting off the money chairs meeting and things are just moving quickly. We're still trying to figure out, ARPA is not coming to the state as one huge pile of money. It's more designated. And so we're trying to figure out exactly what's there and how it's going to be managed. So it is a, a work in progress and Hopefully, we'll know more by the end of the week. But we're looking in a world in which on March 31st, the feds changed the tax code for the previous year, you know. And that's like 15 well, days before the, your fi taxes are supposed to be filed. Um, this is not the normal world, so. So I'm looking. Uh... Looking forward to the meeting tomorrow, Chris. 
we have not been asked specifically for suggestions to give the Senate Appropriations Committee, but we're very much working on recommendations to give the Senate Appropriations Committee with the ARPA money. Yeah, I think health and welfare is looking, uh, especially at the child care bill, because that is a bill in play that has some serious implications for ongoing funding and some serious money attached to it. Um, but for instance, a year ago, Senate Ag dreamed up $50 million sort of, and then we were told, well, you can, you can play with 30. And so yeah. with a bunch of time though, you're, I'm hearing folks say, maybe we'll have three or four days. That's frustrating, but, um, uh, I did just get an email from Representative Till. They voted out the S-53. Uh, <laughs> yep. It has a new exemption. Uh, it has the exemption for menstrual products, but also major restructuring of Vermont's corporate tax structure, the cloud tax, exemption of income tax for first 10 grand of military retirement, and change in mutual fund DFR registration fees. So we've gone back to that one. So... We may, we may, if I had a guess, we might want to consider just tacking on the menstrual exam. I, I think that one, I, I, well, I did tell you that Representative Ansel did tell me that that's what she thought. She didn't tell me about the 10,000 in the, uh, so we're going to tax the state employees pension, but not the generals. Uh, I think we might get some pushback there, but um, that's out of committee, but it's not off the floor, is it? Yeah. So we'll have to, I, I at this point, uh, can't see us doing the cloud tax. They always send that to us, usually on miscellaneous, yeah, like the last two weeks of the session. Um, I don't see us passing that one out. I think if we want to take anything off it, it'll go on miscellaneous tax. And then they have spent all year in this corporate tax. And I think a good part of last year, this is their, you know, major work for the year. And we'll look at that and we'll look at the cloud tax. Um, and, but I, I can't see how we're going to get anything out. And I don't think when you send something over three weeks before a committee, you know, a major bill that you can expect that we're going to do it, but we'll see. Uh, are we ready to end the? I think we're ready to end live stream. I think okay. everybody's ready to end everything. Okay. We'll be back tomorrow. Um, We'll see everyone.